Hello everyone and welcome to another Cut Rate Commander Precon Upgrade Guide, the series in which we take a look at Precon decks and bring them up to Cut Rate standards. My name is Grazit and today we'll be looking at the Legends Legacy Precon from Dominaria United and its face commander, Dehada Binder of Wills, which we'll be bringing up from its roughly $40 price point to an increased budget of $75 after upgrades. But before we continue, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you like this content and would like me to continue making more videos like this in the future. And if you're feeling particularly generous, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description to keep me caffeinated as I work on more of these builds. Also, be sure to stick around until the end of the video to see who won last week's poll and what commanders you'll be voting for for an upcoming episode. So, with that out of the way, let's start by taking a look at the commander and game plan. Dehada Binder of Wills is a Planeswalker with 5 loyalty that can be our commander, costs 1, a red, a white, and a black, and has the following abilities. Her plus 2 gives up to 1 target legendary creature Vigilance, Lifelink, and Indestructible until our next turn. Her minus 3 has us reveal the top 4 cards of our deck, letting us put any legendary cards revealed into our hand and sending the rest to the grave, creating a treasure card for each card sent to the graveyard this way. And her minus 11 has us gain control of all non-land permanents until end of turn, untapping them and giving them haste until end of turn as well. Breaking down her core stats, Dehada is sporting a mid-size CMC, a good starting loyalty for her cost, and abilities that provide a solid foundation for protecting and digging for legendaries, alongside a backbreaking ult that's more than capable of winning games on the spot. Going more in-depth into her abilities, Dehada's plus two is an amazing and long-lasting buff for legendary creatures, making them very hard to interact with thanks to Indestructible, Vigilance allowing them to swing in with impunity while still being available to block for us or Dehada, and Lifelink helping pad our life totals on both offense and defense. And since this lasts until our next turn, the recipient gets to enjoy a full turn of protection, while Dehada benefits from having a very resilient blocker to screen attacks for her for the duration of the turn as well. But as good as her plus 2 is, her minus 3 may be even better, as it provides both substantial card advantage and ramp for the build. And it should be noted, we're under no obligation to keep any of the legendaries we reveal, allowing us to send all 4 cards to the bin to effectively allow Dehada to pay for herself when she comes down, or provide us with a huge spike in mana to help us cast our big spells well ahead of curve. Ultimately, making this a very powerful ability we can use to reload our hand, stockpile mana, and often both at the same time. And finally, if we're lucky enough to get to her minus 11, we'll effectively win the game off the back of what is basically a superpowered insurrection, turning every single non-land permanent our opponents control against them. And while yes, it only lasts a single turn, considering they'll have nothing left to defend themselves with except cards in hand, we'll rarely need anything more than that to finish them off. So, as we can see, Dehada is clearly a legendary-focused commander, being more than capable of protecting legendaries and digging for them from our deck, all while providing solid ramp to help us cast them. Which is why in this precon upgrade, we'll be focusing on getting huge, impactful legends on the board and using Dehada along with other sources to get them to stick around for as long as possible and take over the game. The base build already has a handful of legends that are outright terrifying if they can't be dealt with on site, which we'll be building on even further to take maximum advantage of the protection Dehada provides them with, and allowing them to use their oppressive abilities unimpeded for longer. But while Dehada's protection is certainly impressive, it's by no means flawless, so we'll be adding to the core build's already built-in selection of reanimation and recursion sources with some of our own sources of protection, ensuring that our legendary creatures are a nightmare to remove and, in the off chance that they are, we can easily reanimate or recur them to fight again once more. So let's step back and let this demonic planeswalker show us just how capable she is. It's been over three centuries since Dahada last set foot on Dominaria, and while she may have failed in her quest for power during the Planeswalker War, she's nothing if not patient. And now she has finally returned to finish what she started all those centuries ago, having used this time to assemble a mighty army of corrupted heroes and earning the favor of powerful Phyrexian benefactors, and now aiming to set in motion the endgame that Yogmoth began millennia ago. So now that we have a better understanding of the commander and game plan, let's take a look at the cards we'll be keeping from the base build. Beginning with the creatures we'll be keeping from the base build, the legendary powerhouses Bladewing Deathless Tyrant and Atali Primal Storm will of course be keeping their spots, both being poster creatures for what we're looking for in our legends, possessing huge stat blocks alongside powerful and repeatable abilities, which Dehada can ensure they live long enough to use and completely take over the game with, by flooding the board with tokens or casting free spells respectively. Krinko Tin Street Kingpin and Zerium Golden Wind also make it in under this grouping, not quite possessing the massive stat blocks of the previous entrance, but still being more than capable of taking over the game with an ever-growing army of tokens so long as they stick, which is again made all the easier by our commander. 
Ashling the Pilgrim then closes out this category, synergizing spectacularly with our commander despite her small size. With Dehada not only quickly getting us the mana we need to load her up with counters so she can board wipe, but also allowing Ashling to survive the wipe on top of gaining us life equal to the damage she deals with it thanks to lifelink. From there, it's then on to legends that can help keep our other key creatures alive. With Moira Urborg Haunt and Garner the Bloodflame both keeping their spots, thanks to being able to easily reanimate or recur any of our lost creatures so we can use them again, and Audric Lunark Marshall staying in as well, thanks to being able to spread Dehada's indestructibility to all our creatures at the beginning of each combat, giving our opponents only a small window on their main one to remove them before they become indestructible for the remainder of the turn. It's then on to some legendary support creatures. With Shanid Sleeper Scourge staying in as a solid source of repeatable card advantage as we play and cast our legendaries, while also tacking on an AoE menace to all our legendary creatures as a bonus, Arvad the Cursed making the cut by providing a solid stat increase to all his fellow legends, and whose death touch combines very well with Indestructible to make him a very potent blocker, the Peregrine Dynamo keeping its spot thanks to its ability to double up on our non-commander legendary's abilities on the cheap, and Cadric Soul Kindler making the grade by providing us with the insane ability to get temporary hasty copies of our legendaries, including our commander, which allows us to get her draw, ramp, and protection all in one turn for only a single mana more when we cast her. Then closing out our creature carryovers, Kotha Fed Soul Hoarder stays in as a decent source of card advantage on a big evasive body for us to swing in with. Jazal Goldmane keeps his spot by providing us with a solid way to pump our board for Alpha Strikes, which we can activate multiple times if we have the mana. And Captain Lannery Storm hangs on thanks to being a relatively low cost legend that, when protected by Dahada, can safely swing in and generate treasure for us to spend on our bigger legendaries. Our instant carryovers are then up next, with it consisting of the removal suite, Bedevil, Generous Gift, Hero's Downfall, Mortify, and Wear and Tear, all of which provide us with a potent threat removal that our colors are known for to deal with any problematic threats our opponents are able to get on board. It's then on to our kept sorceries, with the card advantage duo Knight's Whisper and Read the Bone staying in to provide our build with no fills draw in exchange for life, which our on-demand life gain makes relatively inconsequential, and the legendary spells Urza's Ruinous Blast and Primeval's Glorious Rebirth closing out our kept sorceries. The former being a devastating exiling wipe that leaves our boards relatively unscathed after the dust settles, and the latter reanimating our entire creature base, working very well with the hottest second ability to both fill up our bin with targets while accumulating the mana we need to cast it. Then reaching our carryover enchantments, we'll be keeping the lone entrant from the base build, Day of Destiny which like Arvad provides our legends with a solid boost to their stats, this time from the relative safety of the back row where our opponents hopefully won't be able to reach it as easily. It's then on to our artifact keepers, starting with the Mana Rocks, Soul Ring, Arcane Signet, and Felwar Stone, all of which serve as cheap ramp to help us boost the speed and consistency of our mana base. Some legendary artifact keepers are then up next, with Blackblade Reforge staying in as a powerful scaling buff that works very well with our lifelink to get greater and greater swaths of life back as our creatures crack in. The Reaver Cleaver keeps its spot as another solid equipment that provides a steady stream of treasures on damage, as well as granting Trample and a small stat boost to facilitate proccing it. Hero's Podium remains in thanks to providing both a scaling stat boost for our legendary creatures as we assemble them and a repeatable means to dig for them. And Gerard's Hourglass Pendant makes it in as a flash speed way to protect our board from removal that also serves as a silver bullet against extra turn effects. And finally, reaching the lands that made it in from the core build, the Painlands, Battlefield Forge, and Caves of Kolos retain their positions thanks to providing us with reliable access to our colors in exchange for relatively little life, as do Dragon Skull Summit, Smoldering Marsh, and Foreboding Ruins, which we can usually get into play untapped while still providing decent color coverage. The Scrylands, Temple of Malice, Temple of Silence, and Temple of Triumph will also be keeping their spots, being slower than the previous entrance, but still providing decent fixing and adding an ETB card selection with their Scry 1 to help smooth out our early draws. Command Tower will of course also keep its position, along with the slower but still reliable Nomad Outpost to give us access to all our colors, as will the Slow Fetches Evolving Wilds and Thermorphic Expanse, which can instead fix us on demand by fetching up our basics. The legendary lands Gaia Reach Sanitarium, Miko Kuro Center of the Sea, and Shizo Death Storehouse will be staying in as well, all possessing decent utility with their card selection draw and evasion granting respectively, while occasionally benefiting from our legendary payoffs. Then wrapping up our utility land holdovers, Bajuga Bog keeps its spot by providing us access to decent graveyard hate from the Lancelot, Reliquary Tower makes it in as a means to keep from overdrawing when using our commander's second ability, and Tyrite Sanctum makes the grade as a solid form of protection by granting a legendary creature an indestructible counter, freeing up Dahada to protect someone else. And finally, we'll be keeping the six plains, five swamps, and five mountains from the base build as our basics to round out our mana base. 
That leaves us with a final tally of 67 cards, including basic lands we'll be keeping from the base build, leaving us with 33 cards to replace. So now that we've covered all the cards that made the cut from the core build, let's move on to our upgrades. Starting off with our creature upgrades, we'll begin by adding some additional powerhouse legendaries that get maximum benefit from Dahada's protection. So we'll be swapping out an Afenza Kintry Spirit, drawn a Liberator of Malakir, and Karazev Skyship Raider, whose counter distribution and token creation are a bit too slow for us in this build, for Draka Seth Maw of Flames, Kervik the Merciless, and Oros the Avenger, all of which have huge stat blocks along with powerful and repeatable damage based effects as they swing in, or opponents cast spells, or they deal damage respectively, making them perfect targets for Dahada to protect, allowing them to stick around for as long as possible and not only deal significant damage but also gain us life back every time they do so. In a similar vein, we'll be exchanging the Heb Dreadhorde Champion, whose card selection and ramp are okay but not too impactful in this build, for Heartless Hidetsugu, who our commander again shores up his greatest weakness of being a kill on sight creature and again, when combined with lifelink, generates us an insane amount of life back every time he burns the table. And as our last powerhouse entrant, we'll be cutting Traxos Scourge of Krug, whose untapping gimmick would be better served in a more dedicated build, and replacing him with Piru the Volatile, who may not benefit from our commander as much as the other entrants, as she actively wants to be destroyed to be able to clear the board, but is still a massive evasive beat stick as well as a superb board wipe that dodges our entire creature base, which we can easily bring back thanks to our build's recursion and reanimation. Then switching gears from powerful legendaries and onto ways to help pay for them, we'll be cutting Adiana Captain of the Guard and Tajik Blade of the Legion, both of who are more suited for go wide builds, as well as Varric Warped Singir, who's a spectacular commander but whose skills are wasted in this build due to lack of life payment effects, and adding in Kalein Reclusive Painter, Mahadi Emporium Master, and Gadric the Crown Scourge, all of which give our build additional treasure generation to help us get to our bigger legends faster. With Kalein turning our treasures into increased stats for our creatures as we use it to pay for them, and Mahadi and Gadric turning our removal and wipes into heaps of treasure for even more ramp. Then we'll be adding one more treasure-focused entrant, with Belborka Spectral Sergeant and her lackluster impulse draw being axed in favor of Magda Brazen Outlaw, who in the early game is a decent source of treasures herself, but really shining alongside our commander and other sources of treasure generation, allowing us to use those treasures to cheat any artifact or dragon from our deck into play, of which we have plenty of very powerful entrants that will completely take over the game if we're able to get to them. From there, it's on to upgrades that help our legendary creatures stay on board, with the Shar Ancestor's Apostle and Alicia who smiles at death being cut since their reanimation hits creatures and permanents far too small for us to make use of, in favor of Athreo Shroud Veiled and Chainer Nightmare Adept. The former's reanimation even bypassing exile-based removal and even letting us target our opponent's creatures with it to bring them back under our control upon their demise, and the latter letting us pitch dead cards, or even better, other reanimation targets to easily recur our legends from the bin over and over again while also making them hasty when they come back to boot. Following the reanimation trend, Josu Vest Lich Knight and his overcosted kicker loses his spot to the new Dominaria United entrant, Radadrabic of Urborg, who may not reanimate per se, but does create many non legendary versions of our destroyed creatures, which may be even better if we bring back the originals to double up on their effects. Then we have some AoE reanimation joining us, with Sword of the Chosen and its limited once per turn buff being swapped out for Gerard Weatherlight Hero, who serves as a very potent board wipe deterrent that reanimates our entire board if he's destroyed, forcing our opponents to deal with him first if they even want a chance of cracking our board states. And then closing out our reanimators, we'll be cutting Zatalpa Primal Dawn and its assortment of keywords for the even more expensive Rhea Dawnbringer. Her cost being well worth the price by providing us with free unconditional reanimation once per turn, which once combined with the hottest protection is very difficult for our opponents to stop. Another pair of angels then join our host with the spare artifact hero's blade and commander sphere being moved out to make room for Lace, a forgotten Archangel and Archangel Avison. The former giving us even more ways to protect our creatures by recurring them back to hand upon death, and the latter starting off as a surprise AoE indestructibility grantor that later turns into a mini wipe if we lose a creature, with both also possessing impressive evasive stat blocks to go with their abilities. And finally, we'll be cutting some of our extra lands to make room for even more legends, with Boros Garrison being cut in favor of Torolf God of Fury, whose front face has a solid stat block and an ability that gets us extra mileage out of our damaging effects, while his back face, Torolf's Hammer, provides a solid offensive stat boost and on-demand bolt for our legends, or Zav Basilica being replaced with Varagoth Blood Sky Sire, who works perfectly with Dahada as a death-touching blocker that can safely tutor anything up to the top of our deck for only two mana, 
and Rakdos Carnarium being axed for Mila Crafty Companion. Yet another MDFC whose front face is a decent source of loyalty counters and cards as our commander and creatures get targeted, and her back face, Luca Wayward Bonder, providing decent draw, temporary reanimation, and a Warstorm Surge-like ult to pile on the damage even more. It's then on to our instant upgrades. Where the only changes we'll be making will be swapping out the Rill of Possibilities card selection and Unbreakable Formations protection for some additional removal in the form of Terminate and D-Spark, giving our build a few more cheap ways to deal with threats which the core build was severely lacking. We won't be seeing too many changes to our sorcery lineup either. With the board wipe Kaya's Wrath being swapped out for Yawgmoth's Vile Offering to give us access to another legendary spell that serves as both removal and reanimation, Faithless Looting's card selection being traded in for Search for Glory to give us access to a very good legendary tutor, and Ambition's Cost being exchanged for Painful Truths, which will usually still draw us three cards for one mana cheaper to let us cast it easier in the early game. Our artifacts, however, will see a decent number of changes, starting with Hazret's Monument, Bantu's Monument, and Oketra's Monument all being cut, being solid cards individually, but finding superior homes and more dedicated builds that can make use of their abilities better, along with Honor Worn Shaku and Hedron Archive, whose colorless mana production doesn't help us too much in our three-color build, replacing them all with Boro Signet, Orzov Signet, Rakdo Signet, Talisman of Hierarchy, and Wayfarer's Bobble, all of which speed up our early game ramp and fixing to considerably boost the deck's consistency. And as our last artifact upgrade, we'll be exchanging the more legendary knight-focused Circle of Loyalty with the more general legend-focused Avacyn's Memorial. Its ability to make a good chunk of our deck indestructible, including our commander, making our boards nearly impossible to crack without a healthy amount of non-destruction removal and wipes. It's then onto our Planeswalker editions, with the ill-fitting equipment Tenza Godo's Maul being cut in favor of Kaya the Inexorable, who provides more protection with her recursion, solid exile-based removal, and a powerful legend-focused ult that gets us free legendary spells from our hand, grave, and even exile, which also includes herself if we want to get her right back after ulting. And finally, reaching our new land upgrades, we'll be swapping out the mediocre legend payoff Mobilized District and the random burn land Shivan Gorge for the reveal lands Shine Shadow Snarl and Fury Calm Snarl, both of which provide good fixing that has a decent chance of coming into play untapped. So, now that we've covered all 33 cards we've upgraded from the core build, let's take a look at the breakdown for this precon upgrade. This deck currently has 34 creatures, 7 instants, 7 sorceries, 1 enchantment, 14 artifacts including MDFCs, 3 planeswalkers including our commander and MDFCs, and 36 lands. Looking at the stats add matter to our game plan, we have a total of 34 legendary creatures, 30 legendary creatures with repeatable effects or passive abilities, 13 non-creature legendaries, 11 cards that reanimate creatures, 3 cards that can recur creatures back to hand, and 4 cards that make creatures indestructible giving us nearly half a deck's worth of legendaries of all kinds to work alongside Dehada, the vast majority of which benefit from our commander's indestructibility granting to keep using their abilities or to keep them online, as well as plenty of other ways to make sure our legends keep coming back to the field or never leave it in the first place. For general deck stats, we have 15 ramp sources, 10 card draw sources, 11 targeted removal sources, and 5 board wipes. Our ramp and wipes being slightly higher than normal since some of them are tied to our legendary creatures, with our draw and removal falling within more typical ratios. Looking at our mana curve, we have 3 1 drops, 13 2 drops, 17 3 drops, 11 4 drops, 9 5 drops, 4 6 drops, 4 7 drops, 2 8 drops, and 1 9 drop leaving us with a midweight curve that aims to get a legendary creature down quickly, followed by Dehada to make them indestructible and safely block for her, allowing her to safely take up her ult or instead dig for more legends while ramping us to help us cast them. The final price then comes out to be 7519 after upgrades. This price does not include tax and assumes that the price you paid for the precon was $40. The price of the cards was calculated by using the cheapest listed marketplace price on TCG Player at the time of this recording. For side grades, Thalia's Lancers are worth considering if we want an additional tutor effect for our legends that we can reanimate as needed to use again. Lyzel Valaketh's Champion works well with our commander to help her get to her ult noticeably faster, and Yoshimaru Ever Faithful is a low cost legend and legendary payoff that just keeps getting bigger and bigger as the game progresses to both protect Dahada and swing into our opponents with. For further upgrades, Olivia Crimson Bride and Junji the Midnight Sky are both solid legends that fit with our reanimation game plan with their on attack and on death reanimation, as does Shouldry the Whispering One who can reanimate our creatures by just existing, as well as forcing our opponents to sack theirs. 
Elish and Orn Grand Cenobite would also make for an excellent creature addition, her passive being infuriating for our opponents to deal with, especially with Dehada protecting her. And then if we fancy adding additional legendary lands to the build, Iganjo Seed of the Empire, Takanuma Abandoned Mire, and Sokenzan Crucible of Defiance are all decent options that add colored mana, that can also alternatively be channeled for their effects, and Iganjo Castle, Shinka the Bloodsoak Keep, and Urborg Tomb of Yogmoth being more expensive options that offer very solid abilities while on board. And finally, Avacyn Angel of Hope makes for a superb if costly creature addition that protects all our permanents while being a huge evasive beat stick herself, and Volrath Stronghold serves as another legendary land that helps us get our legendary creatures back into play, with the added benefit that you can tell your friends and family that you've made some significant land investments. Thanks everyone for sticking around until the end of the video. Taking a look at the results of last week's poll, it looks like Mira Scholar of Antiquity was able to pull off a huge upset and claim the top spot, so look forward to a Gruul Artifacts build featuring her next week. Then proceeding to this week's poll, our new contenders will consist of the Rakdos Aristocratic Tutor, Lagmos Hand of Hatred, the Golgari Graveyard Hater and Token Creator, Nemata Primeval Warden, and the Simic Spell Doubler, Ivy Gleeful Spell Thief. Please cast your vote in the community tab, link in the description, and let me know in the comments who you voted for and what commanders you want to see from Dominaria United in future polls. Before we close out, again, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe if you haven't done so already, as this channel cannot grow without your support. And if you feel like showing your thanks by keeping me caffeinated while I make these videos, please consider buying me a coffee at the link in the description. And if any of you would like to support the channel in a different way, feel free to check out the other deck techs floating around my head if you'd like to see the latest builds, or click on the link above for a playlist of all the Cutrate Commander episodes I've made so far. And with that, have a good one folks, and stay safe.